Good morning. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the webinar, The Case for Conducting a Gender Audit at Your Organization. My name is Selena Guerrero. I'm Director of Business Development for Orange Grove Consulting. And I'm here with Jody Dutchen, our managing partner. Hi, everybody. We are looking forward to getting started. Uh, you will likely see a Q&A box on your screen. If you have questions, please feel free to ask them. Uh, we may not answer them during the presentation, but we will definitely get to them at the end. So feel free to uh, add them when they, when they pop into your head. The purpose of this webinar is to share with you what a gender audit is and why we think it's useful for many stakeholders within an organization. CEOs, managing directors, even general counsels, as well as, of course, leaders in diversity and human resources. What we found at Orange Grove Consulting is that organizations want more women to compete and they are trying to create more gender balanced leadership teams. But what we've also found is that they're struggling to figure out how to make it sustainable or they're struggling to make the case to upper management to get support to make those investments in the first place. So we know organizations have limited investment and will make a case for how the gender audit helps to maximize your investment for the longer, more sustainable term. Quickly, our agenda, we're gonna talk about the challenge and then the opportunity, the business benefits of gender equity. We're gonna talk briefly about the idea of perception versus reality when it comes to gender in the workplace. We'll discuss what barriers exist that are making it difficult to not only create but sustain that gender balanced organization. And of course, we will then walk through the gender audit. There are concerns that come up when companies consider doing a gender audit. So we're going to address those briefly. And then we will, of course, we'll cover the benefits and make that our case of why this is a good tool for, for many, as I said, many stakeholders within an organization. And then, of course, we'll address questions. So the basic challenge companies are facing as women are simply underrepresented across industries. Some statistics to think about, women hold almost 52% of all professional level jobs, but at the leadership level, it can be 10, 20, 30% in those influential positions. McKinsey and Lean In did a particular study, and in that study found women were 79% likely to move from senior manager to director or VP. However, men were 100% likely to do that. And that's a 21% gap. And another McKinsey study because it, uh, stated that because gender equity is such an embedded problem, unless we really make concerted efforts for change, we're not gonna see equity as a norm for nearly another 100 years. So it's a question of how are we gonna make these strategic investments, which is why we're discussing the gender audit. And of course, it's really about identifying the specific areas of challenge within your organization that provides the path to most impactful opportunities for improvement. So with any given challenge, there is an opportunity. Uh, again, if you're on this webinar, you're likely already understand the benefits of a more gender balanced organization, but we, we wanna just outline a few here, given that the purpose of the audit is to deliver some of those benefits. And, and Jody's gonna talk through those a bit. Sure. So first off, you have competitiveness. So fostering diversity cultivates this innovative culture and this innovative mindset so that you can more effectively adapt and then compete. Secondly, you have cost savings. When you address professional challenges specifically related to women, it can improve retention and it reduces turnover costs. But giving high potential talented women room to grow, it makes recruiting easier and it makes it less expensive. And then it positions your company as an employer of choice. In terms of revenue, which is another benefit, at the more you engage and retain this diverse workforce, it attracts and retains a diverse client base and this positively impacts your bottom line. And then finally, you have inclusivity. Opening up a gender conversation to include everybody builds inclusive advocacy and collaboration. And embedding a culture of inclusivity attracts the widest range of the best talent. It's a virtuous cycle. Excellent. So what we see as a main block to this sustainable change is that there is a perception problem when it comes to gender. And of course, as many of you know, what we're really talking about here is bias. Um, Jody's going to give a few examples of this invisible bias that the audit seeks to uncover. Yeah, so for example, firstly, 
sometimes this is based off research people's perception is that when they see 10 or maybe even 20 percent of women in top leadership positions it feels normal so that the fact that there's not a lot of women is a normalized experience or they have a perception that this represents gender equity secondly especially when there are more women or as more at, at many um as many women at a company as men the perception is okay we've got equal it's it's totally fine but when we refer to gender equity, we refer to leadership that's guiding the company. So it's not about what happens in the bottom, and that's not even what happens at the beginning, in the middle, it happens across the organization. Let's look at healthcare. So in healthcare, a lot of the support jobs are manned by women. Nurses, for example, make the majority of employees, but there's almost you know, the predominance of men at the top. They're still leading the organizations. This is especially true of the largest nonprofit healthcare organizations. And then thirdly, if you look at many organizations, what you'll see the, that the women who are on the leadership team are in marketing or in HR. So even if you have women, you often have women that are siloed. Excellent. So what we've learned is that this perception versus reality, people perceive that there may be equity and there's not, or um, they don't, they might, there might be bias, but they don't recognize it. This is a, a problem embedded throughout an organization. And, and um, there are really three key areas where these barriers exist. And this is why we include all three of these in our gender audit. Yeah, we really look at this from three different perspectives. The first one is women. So this comes out of our primary research in our book, The Orange Line, A Woman's Guide to Integrating Career, Family, and Life. And what we found is that there are really three rules that drive women's behavior. And these are embedded assumptions that have been socialized over women's lifetime. So for example, we've got to do it all. We've got to look really good while we're doing it. And we have to be oh so very nice. So for example, we might focus our energy on doing all the work perfectly, when in fact, the situation, the production, the output may not really need perfection. Secondly, we have biases in men and women, especially in managerial roles. And these biases are also socialized, and this shows up in behavior and decision making. So for example, a manager might not even ask a mother whether or not she can travel and just assume that of course she cannot. So rather than giving her the choice, it just immediately limits her options. And then thirdly, we have the systemic biases, and these are the ones that are very hidden. Many processes in hiring or promotion, for example, have embedded biases in them, and we cannot see them, they are invisible. So we don't recognize that they're even there. So for example, you might have a very masculine job description that says, we want a competitor, we want a top performer. And other words that signal to women, okay, I'm not really welcome here. Yeah, and so this audit is a tool that's gonna help us uncover these invisible barriers, these biases in each of these three areas. So we can reap the benefits we talked about earlier. Right. Uh, so Jody, you're gonna talk everybody, uh, walk everybody through the audit now. Sure. So the first stage is a, a stakeholder committee. We call it the prelude. And it's our really, it's our first step. And what we're looking for here is for the initiative to be seen as strategic. Oftentimes when you're dealing with women's, uh, how do we get more women to senior leadership, we see it as a sort of an adjunct thing that somebody does over in the corner. And what we're talking about is making this a strategic initiative. So we're looking for a cross section of people in operations beyond just the women's affinity group or ERG. We want the CEO or executive business unit support, absolutely essential and needs to be visible. And we need both men and women on this committee. And as part of this committee, they create, we create the vision. So what would it look like if we're able to move beyond these embedded biases? What do you as a company want to achieve? And then we establish the expectations of the process, what this is gonna look like, what, what, what will the outcomes look like, and some accountability. So how do we hold people accountable within the process? Step two is the gender audit itself. And so first we're, we're laying out the messaging. What do we want to communicate to the organization about why we're conducting this process and what the expected outcomes are? We really use interviews, survey, and data analysis to really look at this whole 360 approach of what's going on. So let's take, for example, if we're look, working with a 200 person business unit, We'll send out a survey to everybody in the BU. Typically, we'll get response rates above 70% because of the stakeholder committee involvement. Interviews supplement this, so that enables us to do a deep dive and find out more of the nuance around all these different aspects. And 
So for a 200 person business unit, again, we typically interview about 30 to 40 people. And that allows us to really get a wide view, variety of viewpoints around some of the data in the, in the survey itself. And then thirdly, we use available HR da data to identify challenges such as who's taking advantage of the flexibility programs or what's the velocity of promotion. And so we use these three areas of data to really triangulate the findings and give a lot of substantive support to the analysis. The third stage is the report. And in this report, we've we provide a scorecard, which is a high level view of what we found, and we explain our analysis in each area of the scorecard using what we learned to identify the challenge areas. Finally, we make action oriented recommendations based on our experience. We also ground this in research and it's very application oriented. So that means our recommendations are feasible and they're actionable. And this enables us to take the stakeholder committee, bring them back together and do very specific action planning. So the first thing you need to do in this phase is really prioritize the implementation plan, this postlude. And what we do is we compare the impact of the different recommendations with the effort involved to identify which recommendations will help you move the needle and reach the vision. I want to reemphasize we focus on solutions that are realistic. We also look at what solutions might be quick fixes and then look at which ones might require more time and effort. So for example, changing a job description that you're at for an advertising a new position, that's a pretty quick change. Doesn't take a lot of time and you can usually have one or two decision makers just have it done. Adapting the promotion process is of course a more in-depth effort and that's going to take more time. You want to do both, but we'll figure out which ones we can get quick hits to show that we're making progress more immediately, and then which ones will take us more time and effort. The goal setting, the dashboard, and the annual report are all pieces to enable you to measure progress over time in a very simple and straightforward way, and then hold people accountable to the goals that we've laid out. And throughout the whole process, we're focusing on operational and strategic advantage. In other words, how can you more effectively leverage your talent so that you can gain a competitive edge? So let's show you a snapshot of the scorecard itself. So this is uh, just a sample of a scorecard that we use that helps us pinpoint where the real, real problems are so that you can give yourself measurable goals and then maximize your return on investment. So we evaluate uh, key performance indicators within 10 gender equity performance areas at three levels, at the entry level, at the mid level, and the senior level. And we do that because the, the dynamics that you see at each level very much differ. So we wanna really tease out these different components. We help the cli our clients use this audit to help determine which particular activities and processes to target. So again, they can get the ROI. When we talk about prioritization, this is the tool we will base it on. And this is the heart of what you'll get. It's not just grades. What it is is an analysis of each area, and it gives you a snapshot for the stakeholder committee. Great. So given that we have what pretty much what an audit the activities in an audit, and we have our snapshot of our scorecard, you're probably wondering, well, what exactly is, you know, is contained in the report? So we're going to talk through, Jody will walk you through some sample outcomes, what will actually be in the report, what could potentially be in a, in an, uh, in a report that's provided. Sure. So just to give you a couple of examples, the first one you'll see is some unconscious biases in decision making. So for example, you'll be able to see who's, who is receiving the types of special projects that actually lead to promotion and who is not receiving those types of projects. The second thing you'll see is biases embedded in people and within the processes of hiring, promotion, and retention. So for example, you might see men or managers socialized assumptions where there's a preference for certain behaviors which favor men. For example, oh, he reminds me of myself. And this, those types of things will typically come out in the interview process. Thirdly, we'll see, we might see a preference for an hours versus outcome orientation, which rewards face time rather than income, impact or outcome. So that, that, and that tends to actually disadvantage women. Fourthly, you might see a lifestyle problem with the role. So for example, only women are the ones that are taking flex time, which means that flex time is seen as a thing for mothers to do and other people who may want it aren't really allowed to do it. So it's a cultural piece. Fifthly, we might see a departmental culture issue. So you might have one business unit that is predominantly male or male-centered and women don't feel welcome. Whereas you may have another department that is perfectly fine. 
you might also find a personal bias issue of an individual manager. So perhaps a senior executive woman who thinks that all women should work hours like she did if they want to advance. So these are some of the things that you might, that might come out in this process. Great. And of course, when you, we know, they know we can provide this type of detail, there, there might be some concern up front. Really, the question is, what happens when the audit uncovers behavior that may need to be addressed? Um, and this is, again, the importance of the stakeholder committee to have a sense of expectation and sort of planning. Jody. Yeah, I think it's really important to firstly think that our goal here is to find solutions. This is not about assigning blame. In fact, quite the opposite. We find that this process actually brings people together and that the goal is to look for opportunities. So we look, we address this like an operational or strategic problem, just like we would any other operational or strategic problem. Secondly, if there's a problem that exists, this anyway, it's gonna come out. This is a proactive approach that will enable you to find it and get ahead of the problems that are bound to surface anyway. And then thirdly, there's this benefit of having an objective outsider, a third party with whom to, with which to partner with to help you address these types of concerns. And the beauty of working with a partner such as us is that we're bringing in our expertise, we're bringing in the research, we're bringing in this objective outside perspective that can sort of differentiate you from the problem. Excellent. So we're going to talk now about the benefits of doing the audit, and this is really the case here. So certainly, as Jody already mentioned, this prioritize action plan. So based on the scorecard and recommendations, you can clearly see where the biggest problems are and have the biggest room for improvement. So this is more about, less about who has the loudest voice around these issues and really taking an overview, a strategic overview of your unit or your organization and saying, okay, we see these as the biggest opportunities. Also, of course, increased leverage for support. Having a report in hand is really helps to overcome that perception problem we were talking about. And so what that means is it gets everyone on the same page, right? When you have a report in hand, everyone agrees where things stand. It's not a per perception, false perception. And then once everyone's on the same page, you can collectively move forward together as a team on implementing change. And I think this is really, really crucial for making sustainable change. Of course, having quantified outcomes to demonstrate the return on the investment and of course to secure budget. So especially if you're on diver in diversity, I mean, you've probably already been doing great work. Um, so conducting an audit and using it as a benchmark for change over time will allow you to show progress and then more confidently make the case for future investments uh, to, sen to senior leadership. And then of course, uh, data to support marketing or brand, this, this is internal and external. Uh, women want to work at companies that are making efforts to advance women. We, we know that. And if a company is willing to take sort of an honest accounting of where they might need to make improvement, it speaks, it speaks volumes. Um, this isn't to suggest you're going to make the audit public, right? But I think it's important to remember that, you know, we're going to show where there's room for improvement. But what we also didn't really spend any time on is where it's going to also report where the organization is already doing great work that they can share, right? Both internally to make women feel very welcome, know that leadership is, is supporting them. And then of course, separately, um, you know, when in on the recruiting side, when companies can talk about the, the good work that they're doing and how supportive are they women. This is again, that you can go back to this report and really say, this is where we were and this is now where we are and this is where we want to be. So fundamentally, the audit helps to create a strategic and a measurable plan for creating a more diverse, inclusive, and gender balanced leadership. And it's a transparent, and it's a controlled, and it's a very quantified process. Um, so I think there's this tremendous benefit in, in sort of knowing where you stand with this and taking a more strategic, uh, quant you know, quantified approach. Jody, did you I know, I'm sure you'd like to add something. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think, I think what's important is, is that this is a real step forward and it's a different step than most companies take. You know, um, here in Massachusetts, if you're calling in from Massachusetts, you know, we have our annual 
Massachusetts Conference for Women. And it's a real statement to send somebody there, but it doesn't actually move the needle in the long term. This does, because it really looks at these problems from a strategic operational perspective. So it's a step forward and it shows a company's commitment and willingness to address the gender challenge. And because it's grounded in data, and data that, that we are able to hear, because oftentimes as a third party partner, people will tell us things that that they won't tell a company because it's grounded in this data and backed by research you get the subjective view of what's going on so it's a powerful way forward excellent okay so i see some questions and it looks like we have plenty of time for that so let's see if i can look here uh okay the question is will we be provided with a copy of this powerpoint um Sure, and we'll be sending, or actually, we'll be sending a, a, a link to a recording, so if you'd like to watch it again or share it with your colleagues. Okay, so a question. On the scorecard, how are issues with any given category related to gender teased out against broader issues? For example, a company may have an overall retention issue versus an issue with retention for a given gender. To what extent are broader issues to the extent present addressed in action planning? Yeah, so that's a great question. And one of the key elements of this is that in the data gathering phase, we actually look at data by gender and we look at it by ethnicity. So that way you can very easily tease out which ones are broader issues or which ones are really affecting a particular group. It's also why we tease out early, mid, and senior levels, because then you can look at it from those three perspectives as well. So it's pretty easy to say, so for example, you might have incredible um, gender equity and ethnicity at the lower levels, and this is actually pretty typical in many companies, but then the minute you get to mid-level, you can see the drop-off. And so it's pinpointing exactly where the problem is, and then understanding why it's happening at that level. So by getting the data and, and parsing it out in that way, we can see it pretty easily. And then to answer your second question, how are the broader issues addressed? This is all part of this prioritization process. So let's just say that you had a retention issue with um, your, early, your early group of people, so people who are in their 20s. And you would basically balance that out against your overall vision and say, well, what is the benefit of dealing with this issue versus the other issues? Because that may be your most, your biggest issue. So in action planning, those are the kinds of conversations that you're going to have. And you're really going to be looking at this idea of impact and effort. Now, again, it, that piece of it, you're going to be doing a little bit of cost benefit analysis to say, okay, if we address this issue, what, what benefits will we receive? And then you compare that with how much effort is that going to require us to make that change? Great. Um, Jody. another question. Um, what, uh, what kind of pushback have you gotten is the question. Yeah, so we get all sorts of pushback because what we're talking about is change. And so whenever you have change, there is some pushback. But this is the absolute purpose of the stakeholder committee. As with all successful change efforts, by having the stakeholder committee involved and making sure that you have representation from a variety of stakeholders and a variety of levels, especially at the senior level, you're showing organizational commitment. And it's amazing how powerful that is. And this is actually backed by a lot of the research in change management that when you get senior leadership on board from the beginning, you keep them informed throughout so that they contextualize and they communicate why this is so important. It actually goes a long way to managing the pushback. Yeah, I, I definitely feel like the stakeholder committee is, is, is going to be a team of people that are going to come to the table with different concerns because they're going to be from different background, you know, different right. areas in the corporate, in the company. And right. so the importance of that visioning session of that together time is to really uh, address those, right? Because we, we, we need to, to be able to accomplish that. Um, so Jody, another question, how long does it take? How long is the gender audit? Yeah, so typically for, let's just, again, we'll use our example of the 200 person business unit because that's a nice size. If you're in a larger company, that's a nice place to start. Um, that typically takes three to four months from really the stakeholder committee initiation through to action planning. Sometimes it can take a little longer, um, doesn't really take less time just because of the, the volume of data that we're going to be gathering, but on average, three to four months. Yeah. Um, so 
how would you suggest I bring this to my senior leadership team? So this is something that we work with people all the time on. It's not something that people have thought about in this way before. So we help people with the, the messaging around this. And the purpose of this webinar, of course, is to help you understand the value of this tool. And, and when you focus on what these benefits are, that really helps show and put this in the context of the business itself. So we really help you partner to get this idea off the ground in your organization and position it as a strategic initiative. And we really strongly encourage that people measure the results so that you can see the benefits. Okay, great. Uh, Jody, what is the largest size company you would work with? So we really don't have a, a limit on the size, but what we recommend is that you don't do a full, like say, say you are a, um, you know, a, a large, a very large multinational company. I would not recommend that you do every unit at once. What you really want to do as with all positive change prog programs, successful change programs, is you want to start with a particular business unit and then trial it there, learn about where some of the resistance is within that particular company, and then roll it out. So that that, you're not doing all or nothing, you're doing it step by step. Uh, so, and then what kind of questions uh, are you asking in the surveys and interviews? Why don't you speak about that? We ask questions around culture, hiring, promotion, decision-making, all types of those types of areas. A lot of the more hidden areas as well. So for example, in decision-making, we might, we will ask some questions about who speaks up in meetings and how decisions are made. We might ask questions about how people perceive barriers or whether they feel they're getting the opportunities they require for promotion. And what we do is we use a research-based approach in developing the questions so that we reduce an inherent bias in the questions it's themselves so that we're really looking at a research, a qualitative research grounding, a qualitative and a quantitative research grounding in these questions. Um, Jody, something I'm thinking about, I mean, uh, what do you think is the, the biggest impact for an organization when they do this? What, what is the, you know, what are they, what, what would they expect in terms of the biggest impact on the organization? So I think, one of the biggest impacts is the sense of fresh perspective. I think what we've heard people tell us as we're out and about and talking to people is, is that, man, you can, take a deep, you can take a deep breath. You can eliminate the blame. There's so much anger and frustration right now in this process, um, just in the conversation in our, in our society right now. And so this really takes away the blame because we're using data, we're using, you know, we're partnering as a third party objective person it brings this greater awareness. There's also a sense of relief that the conversation is being had. So we talk with women all the time that are like, oh my God, this is happening, this is happening. And so now this shows progress. And the CEOs come into these jobs with lots of experience around challenges, but it's something that they've not really seen before. And so one of the things we do, we are educating the CEOs and giving them a safe place to have this conversation and then we can get concrete about how to solve this problem and it's also like we're not throwing spaghetti at the wall and just seeing what sticks we're looking at this in a systematic way where is your problem you might not have a problem with retention you might have a problem with hiring at the senior level or you might not have a problem with hiring at the senior level you might have a problem with recent retention so we're looking at those pieces to help you identify what's the right thing for your company so it's a new conversation and the most immediate outcome for companies is that it gives them a framework for tackling this challenge and it gives senior leadership the tools to actually make that change and everything else falls in place and follows. Yeah, I second the idea of this framework. It's a difficult, you know, in some cases a new conversation or maybe it's a difficult conversation or people think it's going to be a difficult conversation. It's not, but that framework is, is really what this is about. It's really an entry point to open up the conversation, really face that perception versus reality, get everybody on the same page and then benchmark, have benchmarks to work towards. Um, and I think that I just wanted to comment about sort of when we look at goal setting or dashboards or annual report, that's something that can be built off of the back of this audit. Right. Um, and so that you can again, measure and, and really um, it, it, it kind of aligns everybody, I think mostly for sure. 
let me build on that a little bit because I think that's another piece that um, organizations just don't do. There's no, no very, very, very few organizations have dashboards to measure their level of inclusion. And what a dashboard does is shows you your progress. It's not, a, it's not a stick to beat people's heads over. It's a dashboard like you have any other KPI dashboard. And so you're measuring your progress and you're figuring out where your problems are and where your strengths are, celebrating your strengths and then addressing the challenges having data and approaching this problem from a business strategy operational perspective is the piece that I think is going is, is the missing link. I, I don't think it's being done very much. And so this is the opportunity that organizations that want to get ahead of their competitors and really leverage their talent in a way that they hadn't, haven't done before. This is the differentiator. Great. So we've actually, off, we've, we're at 30 minutes and we've answered all the questions. If there's anybody else who has questions, uh, we'd love to hear them now. Don't be shy. Um, and um, of course, if there's no more questions, you know, I'm sure, let's just go back to this final page here. Um, this is a Jody's email and this is my email. And please feel free to email us. Uh, let us know your questions. We'd love to hear your feedback on, on this, um, on this content and, and what you felt. Uh, was useful or not useful, again, just opening up the conversation. Um, uh, we will be sending a follow-up email with a link to the wrist recording. And you, again, you feel free to watch it again or to share it with your colleagues. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions, Jody. Do you want to have any last minute thoughts for the, for the group? I was doing a talk last night in front of a group of women and women in construction. And one of the things that I really emphasize is that as, if we all start to work together on this and just start taking steps forward, this is how we're going to make the change. Right now, we seem to be standing in place, maybe even treading water, maybe even going backwards. And it's time for us to, to try some new tactics, some new strategies to move this conversation forward, but actually to take action and really make the changes that we need to make so that we can get more gender equity in our organizations. And with that, we are done here today. Look forward to hearing from all of you. If any other questions, we hope you have a wonderful day and an excellent weekend. And thank you very much from all of us at Orange Grove Consulting for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you all.